Isn't it remarkable the influence that our parents have on our lives? That's what we explore today here with Oliver Fernandez. He is a construction company business owner and real estate investor out of Washington, D.C. And today's episode is a very interesting one because basically what I do is I hit record and I let Oliver tell his story, how he got into the construction world through the influence of his parents, the ups and downs of starting a construction company, how he learned to cold call when he started his business, what he's learned about growing his organization um, as he's on the journey from 20 million to 40 million and onward to $100 million in revenue, how he shifted from being a sub to a general contractor, and many, many other topics. The thing you like about Oliver is that he's um, very honest and open about uh, his successes, but also his failures. And I think through this conversation, you're going to get you're going to get some tremendous insights in how to build a successful construction company. And so enjoy my conversation with Oliver. Share it with other people. Thank you for listening to Construction Genius. Let's dive right in now. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Oliver, welcome to Construction Genius. Hey, appreciate it, Eric, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, I, I love talking about construction. I grew up in construction when I was, you know, ever since I could remember, my I, my dad had owned a construction company and my my mom worked inside the construction company as well. So they both were like entrepreneurs and I've always been around construction. So when I wanted to start my own construction business, it wasn't like something that was like foreign. Um, it was something that I was a little scared of because when my parents had their construction business, they had made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, went out of business, made a lot of money again in construction, and then it was like lost a lot of money. So there was always this roller coaster ride. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do when I started my construction business was I didn't want to go through that roller coaster ride for a couple of reasons. Number one, it broke up our family. Like when the first roller coaster ride, uh, when they made a lot of money and lost a lot of money, like I moved with my mom and my three sisters to Maine. My dad stayed back and um, to try to pick up the pieces and, and try to re regrow his business. That hurt because then all of a sudden the, the family was broken. And now all of a sudden I was living in Maine, which is like, you know, rural country coming from, you know, Boston. And then my mom was a city girl. So she never really didn't really understand, you know, living in Maine full time. Like going to Maine on vacation was one thing, but living in Maine full time was, was something that was totally out of this world. And uh, now we were living there full time and it was just a struggle. I mean, there would be power outages that we, she wasn't, she was a teacher, so she wasn't making that much money. And it was just, it was just, it just seemed like life was so hard, you know, and it was, like, it was always like the struggle. And it was, it was weird too, because I, I knew what, like, what was possible in this world, because I did see my parents as, as when they were successful. So like having to go back to like really just living paycheck to paycheck and trying to figure all those things out with my mom, um, what was like, was very difficult. So like one of my goals, like coming out of high school and graduating from college was like, I wanted to take care of my mom and three sisters. And that was one of the major reasons for me, uh, starting the construction business. And when you started the construction business and the eyes are wide open, like, yeah, I'm going to be successful in construction. And then you really get hit in the hit with the real world that like it's this is it this is there's a lot of challenges there there's a lot of ups and downs um my my first entrance into construction out of graduating college was i was working for scansco it's a big general contractor i was working for them for like three months and i ended up getting laid off uh so they they gave up on me but i didn't give up on me uh so i just kept sharpening my skills you know and, and i started the business and we we're doing really small jobs in the beginning like you know Two thousand dollar jobs, thirty thousand dollar jobs. It was the start in, of the of the business, and you know now we're doing one to five million dollar projects. Uh, we we completed twenty million dollars worth of business last year, and we're on track to do forty million dollars worth of business this year. Okay, so let me let's just go back to the beginning because there's a there's a lot going on there. Give me your earliest recollection as a as a child 
of your parents in the construction business? What were, what are the first impressions that you had of that? So, you know, my dad was in, in the civil game. So that was always like, you know, the excavators, the dump trucks, the, uh, the bulldozers. And so like from a kid's perspective, I was like, oh, my God, like my, my parents are like awesome. You know, like these are real life like bulldozers and real life excavators. And I could go sit in them and he'd bring me in them. And like it was just it just seemed like it was I was living in a fantasy world. You know, it was awesome. You know, I was like, super excited about all that. Um, but at the same time, there's there's that component of operations of construction. There's the component of financial management of construction. And, you know, when you're a kid, two, two, three, four, five years old, you don't really understand all that stuff. And that's where, you know, that he he struggled it. And that's where there was some failures and there's some some things that needed improvement. And, and, it, and, and it cost him the business in the beginning. So. As as you were going through that, obviously, how old were you when when your parents when the the business um, when it went out of bit did it go out of business or yeah it went out of business and it was uh, I was five years old so I was just going into first grade and I remember because we, we I went into first grade and when I went to move to Maine so first grade five years old. Okay. So first grade. So, so there's like some memories, but, but, but it's again, you're not like a 13, 14, 15 year old. Well, let me ask you this then. What is it about the experience that your parents had with their business that is now motivating you as you've started your business? What are you determined to replicate? What are you determined not to do? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what, like I would like, it almost gave me like this weird, like perfectionism, like, persona you know um and you just, like which is not always a good thing right because like if you want perfection like you're never going to get it so like you're never going to start and it, like the perfectionism came from like not wanting to ever have to put my family through the pain that we all went through when we started off the business you know things were the first job we, we really did uh, as a, a subcontractor that i was running it was a thirty thousand dollar job and the job ended up costing me 60 grand <laughs> <laughs> what and kind of a sub? What kind of a sub are you, were you at that point? I was I was a civil sub, right? So we were installing like underground pipe, um, and then this case oh, wow. it was a box culvert we were installing. It was in Massachusetts. We were doing it on a golf course. So it's funny that you're talking about a golf course. We were doing it on a golf course, and there was two locations we were just installing a, a underground box culvert, and that job like took my took my heart. You know, I was like, oh my god, like. I lost thirty thousand dollars on a thirty thousand dollar job because it cost me sixty grand. <laughs> and it's like at that point, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to do what my dad did to my family. I was like, I want to make money. Like, I at that up to that point, I had never lost money in something, you know. But at the same time, like, I watched how that that GC communicated with me because my price really was sixty grand when I first bid that job. But it, you know, like the way he communicated with me, the way he he like ran the job and the way he executed and he and he the way he communicated with with his with the owner because he was the GC. And I I I took all of those learnings and I'm so glad I didn't give up in that moment because I took those learnings to now go and complete over a hundred million dollars worth of projects in the last ten years. Um, and so I, and I ran them the on exact second. same way. So let, let yeah, let's go back then. So so you bid a project for thirty grand, but you should have bid it for sixty. Right. So the job was 30, 30 grand. It cost me sixty grand. But my first price that I initially submitted was sixty grand. But oh, I, did the I, GC I, I talk you out of sixty grand or something? Did he? Sorry. Did did the GC get you to cut your price? Yeah, he like he simplified the job and tried you know, and I, and I wasn't confident in my numbers at the time. So I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. And I can, do, which I should have never, ever done, you know, and those are the, all the learning experiences that, you know, you, you grow on. That first job, then where you lose 30 grand um, and then you're, you're observing the way the GC is interacting with the owner, the way that GC is interacting with you as a sub. What did you take away specifically from that, that you then applied to the next project and the next project that helped you to become more successful? So it was the way they set up the job, you know, they, they were, they were really organized, you know, and, and the way they, they, they communicated with, with the owner, you know, like until you've actually seen someone communicate with the owner, like you don't really know what to say, what not to say, things that are going to fly, things that are not going to fly. So Getting that experience, yes, it cost me a lot, you know, but at the same time, it was eye opening because my dad had only, when I, well, the stuff that I always saw him do, he was the subcontractor. So he was always talking with another contractor. He was never 
talking to the owner and communicating with the person that had the purse strings that were paying for it was paying for everything. So let me ask you this then, um, cause you're, you know, you started off as a sub and you're a GC now, correct? Correct. What did you learn about communicating with an owner as a sub? What are some of the key things that, that our listeners who are subs can, can, can lay hold of in terms of communicating with owners? Well, one thing that I really liked about, um, you know, to work, working directly with the owner is you touch the money first. That was one of the things that drove me crazy is like we were doing such, we did great work. Everything was executed properly. And then when it came time to get paid, it was like all these excuses and reasons why, you know, we weren't going to get paid the full amount or additional paperwork that was never discussed now needed to be submitted. One of the things is you touch the money first. Uh, number two is the owner cares about the finished product. They don't want to hear all of the bad things that are happening on the project. So it's like, they want the sausage. They don't want to understand how the sausage is made. You know, they don't want to see all the blood. They don't want to see all the guts. They just want the sausage. Even with my team now, I explain that to them. Like, they don't want to hear about the subcontractor not showing up, the paint supply house not having the paint, the mechanical unit being delivered late or you know, or not, not being delivered correctly. Like, what is the solution and how are we going to get this thing to the finish line? Because at the end of the day, that's all they care about. They just want the sausage. They don't want to know how it's made and all of the stuff that that's what they're paying us to do. That would be the, the second uh, most important thing. Uh, if I was a sub thinking what the owner, how you want to communicate with the owner. So how do you maintain your relationship with the GC if you're going to be aggressive in developing a relationship with the owner? Because isn't the GC going to say, you know, stop talking to the owner. You need to talk to me. Correct. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're a subcontractor, you need to respect that, right? We have a part of the business that does do subcontracts. So we have to respect the relationship between the owner and the GC and, and you got to flow all that information up through them. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cross those, those boundaries, but at the same time, it is important to understand how to communicate with the owner because if you're not getting paid as the subcontractor, you need to be able to communicate that to someone, um, especially after you've already worked, tried to work it out with the GC and, and you're, you can't get anywhere with them. Okay. So, so how long were you exclusively a sub as a, a, you know, a civil sub? So I was a civil sub from 2008 to 2013. So five years. Okay. So you started right in the middle of the downturn. Yes. Yep. That's a perfect time to start. That's awesome. <laughs> so you could see that's funny though because you could say man i've been through a downturn so it's not like you know someone who started their business in in let's say 2013 and everything's been awesome for the last 10 years you know yeah no it was definitely a grind like you know getting getting projects and now i just have a better algorithm for how all that stuff works and how the things you need to do in the beginning i you know i had all the, the the trash that i had to still work through i was i was scared to make cold calls i was scared to go to the the, the vendor outreach meetings. I was scared to do all of those things, but I had to work through and, and, and build up the confidence um, in myself to be able to make a cold call, to be able to... Oh, let's, let's talk about that. How did you build your confidence to make cold calls? You know, we had that job that we lost 30 grand on and, you know, it was the, the pressure of like, like almost being at the end of the runway, <laughs> like, you know, like the credit cards are starting to get maxed out, you know, it's like, and I didn't want to be a failure. Remember I was trying to, I was talking about that earlier. I, I didn't want to be another statistic. I didn't want to do what my, my dad did. And I wanted to, I wanted to be successful. So I started, how do I be successful? I got to start getting in front of the people that are going to give me, give me these type of projects or want to work with me on these projects. So it's like, I got to start making the phone calls and then you start making the phone calls and then you're like, Oh, what do I say? I did, I created my script and then I would be like, Oh, I don't want to say that. And I took that out of the script. And then I, I was like, Oh, that really worked this time. So I kept that in the script. And I, tell me about that script. Tell me about that script. Uh, uh, if you can remember, if you can remember, yeah, I know I it's a while. Like, hey, this is all over with McKinsey Construction. We're a general construction company that specializes in HVAC and civil construction. Do you ever offer the uh, ability for companies like myself to come in and, and do a capabilities briefing? And it was just, I, I said that so many times that it's like still ingrained in me to this, this day. I've been saying that since 2013. And it was just like, Getting, how can I get in front of these people? Because like once I got in front of them, at the time I also had a partner, right? And and this partner, he had a, he had been a GC for thirty years, 
I was this young kid and he, he I remember meeting him um, in the, in the airport when we first started like making our joint venture. And um, he's like, Hey kid, you know, I'm a GC. I I've been doing this for 30 years. I have all my contacts. Like I'm not going to give you any of them, but if you find some new projects or new contacts, I'll help you execute on. And that was like all I needed to hear. Cause like, I then I would then make those phone calls and I would get in front of these people and then I would bring him with me and I'd be like, and I would, I would just shut up and just let him do like most of the talking. We got our first job and then I was like, okay, now I understand my role in all of this. And I played that role really well, but at the same time, I paid attention to the things he was saying. I paid attention to how we was running the jobs because I wanted to, I wanted to be, have also have those capabilities. That's interesting because I was going to ask you about how as a young guy, you, you got a, um, a toehold when you didn't have any experience yourself. So what you did at the beginning then is you partnered up with a guy who had a little more experience and kind of th- that helped you to get, get some, some work uh, secured. Oh, 100%. That's how you can press decades in the years, right? Is, there you go. Is you, there you is go. You, is you partner with people and he had something that, that I didn't have and it was, it was experience, but I also had something that he hadn't ever seen before. And that was the tenacity to make the phone calls, the tenacity to get out into the marketplace, the tenacity to get in front of people and, and get the opportunities. We could just apply his expertise to it. And, and now all of a sudden it was a, it was a great partnership. Yeah. It's a trip, man. Cause you know, I know we're in totally different industries. I'm a consultant, you're a, a con- contractor, but when I started my business, I'd gotten fired from this company on the Friday. I started my business on a Monday at the time I had, you know, a wife and four kids at home and so, you know what I did, man? I got out there and I started cold calling. <laughs> I did exactly what you did because I was afraid of failure and I didn't want my, uh, my credit card bills getting racked up either. 100%. And then like that, that motivated me. That it really inspired me. I mean, I wanted to uh, take care of my mom and three sisters. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm creating more debt than being positive. So it was definitely something that motivated me. How long were you working in a, in a, in that partnership or that joint venture? Did, was that like a formal business partnership or was it just you guys were JVing stuff together? How did that work? Yeah. So we would, uh, it wasn't that we had no signed documents or anything, but like, it was just something that like we, we shook hands and was like, Hey, we're going to be 50, 50 partners in doing this. And you know, we went after the contracts and we executed on them together. Um, and that was, it was, a, it was, we had a, we had a great partnership. You know, we, he, he showed me how to project manage. He showed me how to how to speak to the owners, how to communicate and really, you know, even talk to subcontractors and hold them accountable and the business accountable to, um, you know, all, all the owner. And you know, so there was a lot of good things there. At the same time, there there were some broken beliefs there. Right. And some of those broken beliefs were because there was there's so much risk in construction. The thought process was always to, like, con- control all the decisions and. If you're controlling all the decisions, you're going to you're going to limit the size that you are. What I learned over time was that like once we hit 10 million dollars and 12 million dollars and then fell back down to 6, that was that I wasn't going to be able to do everything on my own. I, and if we really wanted to be the 100 million dollar company that I wanted this company to be, I was going to have to allow other team members to make decisions, but also make sure that they were making decisions off of decision matrix and 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 now that's that's what that's the single thing that's like really helped grow the company and expand the company and, and and get the company moving in the direction that I wanted. I've always dreamed of it moving. It was allowing other team members to make decisions, allowing team members to execute on behalf of the company, but also stay in alignment of, with the company, right? And that's all done through leadership and 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 knowing how to keep them aligned in the business and. And, and, and helps grow and scale the business together. Okay, so let's let's explore that because it sounded like right from the beginning, you you got one thing down that people struggle with and that's the sales part, the front end sales. You partnered up with someone with some experience so that you could learn the project management side. As you grow the business, you came across an issue that every con- contractor comes across and that's finding the right people to put in the right position so that you can achieve your goals. Tell us some of the, um, the successes and the failures that you experienced in hiring and on recruiting and hiring people as you um, grown over the years oh man there's been so many uh i remember the the first so we do we do government projects right so you got to have like certain qualifications to be the superintendent and the site safety office health officer and the quality control manager so i remember the first job that we we hit that was like of substantial size a couple million bucks was like 2.6 million dollars down in albany georgia and 
this job was to replace overhead. Coil. And was this as a GC? Was it a GC this when you were a GC? GC. Yeah. And this okay, was cool. a job to replace over like roll up coiling, uh, coiling like overhead doors. And there was like 289 of them that we had to replace. Well, this job was like, like, hey, we had a start date. It was like. Can I, can I just stop you real quick, Oliver? How did you go from underground to replacing doors? So when, how, we, how, when how, we transitioned yeah. to being the prime contractor, to be working directly for the owner, you can't just say, hey, I'm an underground contractor. Well, I, you, I guess you can say that, but you're, you're, you're limiting yourself to like this many projects, right? Whereas now when you're a GC, you, you, you say you, can, you, you do everything, right? And you, you hire the civil guy, you hire the HVAC guy, you hire the, the, the overhead door installing contractor. That was also a huge shift in my thought process. I was like, yeah, I'm a civil guy, but like you just narrow yourself down, especially when you're working with the owner. Because the owner doesn't care about just the civil. They care about their project being complete. And they want A to Z being done. They, you know, they don't care how it gets done. They just want it done. And they're, they're willing to pay you to execute on, on and getting it done. And let me just ask. So, so when, when you shifted from being a sub to being a GC, you picked um, government projects as, as a niche? Correct. And, and, and are you talking about specific government agencies or specific project types? How did you go through that process? So there were specific project types, meaning like, Projects that were like, I wanted to do basically one to $5 million jobs. And, and the, you know, the occasionally when you're marketing for one to $5 million jobs, you catch a, a trout that's like 400 grand. We still did those. We weren't going to turn those away, but it, you know, our goal was to do one to $5 million jobs. I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Oliver. And I'd like to give you a quick reminder that there is a resource that you can tap that can have a tremendous impact on your construction company. And that resource is my book. Construction Genius. It's effective, hands-on, practical, simple, no BS, leadership, strategy, sales, and marketing advice. And it's exclusively for construction companies. I wrote this book condensing the wisdom that we've shared on this podcast over the years, along with the frameworks that I use with my clients every single day to help them to achieve high performance in their companies with regards to leadership and sales and marketing and strategy. And you know what? It's only 20 bucks on Amazon. And this is what you should do. Get 10 or more copies for you and the leaders in your company. And then when you get 10 copies, shoot me an email at eric at constructiongenius.com. And I will reply to that email and we will set up a 60 minute Zoom session with you and your leadership team where I'll do a Q&A about the content of the book and an exclusive leadership training class for your team. That's valued at 2,500 bucks. For you, I'll do it absolutely free. All you have to do is purchase 10 or more copies of the book. The link is in the show notes to the Amazon page. They're 20 bucks a a copy and the book is totally awesome. So go out and buy it, use it in your company. Let me know if you purchase 10 or more and uh, we'll connect and make sure that your leadership team gets upgraded just a little bit. All right, back to our conversation with Oliver. Okay, excellent. All right, so then... um, so you land this you land this one project where you got the overhead doors and and you you need to bring people on board to handle that I'm assuming tell us about that process yeah and I, I mean I had never really even hired people up until this point and I was like you know there was death there was and what year what year are we at Oliver this was 2013 okay cool okay 2013 just starting off to be a GC I, I literally spent a year calling con you know the owners and and, and people that could issue contracts and to the to from the government. And I finally get my, 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 uh, my second contract. And it's like the biggest contract that we've ever gotten to date. And we were on the job where the job is supposed to start and we don't have the superintendent and the quality control manager and, and the site safety and health officer. And I'm like stressing out. Like, I'm like, what, what's going on? Like, I thought my, uh, honestly, I thought my partner was going to be able to help more on that side. What I did is I literally went to the internet and I started like looking up all these like like crazy sites or, and there was this one site where you could like literally type in the search. And I think a lot of them do it now um, where you can literally type in like quality control manager or EM385, which is these keywords that the government uses for their people. And I found, I found like a list of people and I just started calling them. And like, I remember getting a guy that was in, he was already working for another company in North Carolina. And I don't know how I got him to, re, to come and join me and my company and my, this project, but he ended up coming over. And then I got another guy that was in, uh, Kingsville, uh, George, uh, Kings Bay, Georgia. And I got him 
he had just transitioned off of another contract and was was looking for some work. So I got him over here. It was that pressure. It was this that time frame that like I needed someone, and it was like my sole focus was finding that superintendent quality control manager. And I, I made so many mistakes in that process. What I mean by mistakes is like I, I you know. I was just like, I just need you guys here. And then and they, they, they showed up. I had an offer letter signed. I had all those things signed, but I, I didn't really bring them on the way we bring people on now. We bring people on now. Like, are they a cultural fit? Are they, will that be an operational fit? And then it's like, are they a finance? Like, how are they going to impact the business financially? And we're looking at all those three things. Uh, where before it was just like, I, there's a need. I got to get them in here and like, uh, let's roll. And luckily that project, what was successful and those people executed on everything they said they were going to execute on. And, and honestly, one of those people really helped groom me in, in, in building uh, like safety plans and QC plans and all these, these plans that are required for government projects, which then helped us get tens of millions of other projects. So it's interesting you said that because, you know, at the beginning you were just hiring because you had to, and now you've evolved to the point where, you know, 10 years later, you're thinking cultural, operational, and then financial. How did you come to those three specific, those three specific pillars? Yeah. So I, I'm a huge, I'm a huge guy in like finding mentors, right? So when I, when I was first got in the GC game, I had that mentor that, had run a $10 million business. My goal, my my lifetime goal was to get a business that did $10 million a year. So I found that mentor and then all of a sudden, what would you know, after three years, I was 26 years old and had a $10 million business. And How did you like, find that mentor? Huh? How did you find that mentor? That was the How mentor, did you find that, the mentor? I, that I, there was an introduction. My, my dad's one of those guys that like, he's at the gas station pumping gas and he talks to everybody and he meets everybody and he always ha- has a guy that has a guy. So I guess he met this guy at the gym. He, he, And then he made an introduction to me because he knew I was interested in that stuff. So I met him there and that was the mentor that, you know, I, you know, helped me get into uh, government contract and then also helped me grow my business to $10 million. But one of the things that I I didn't do is I, after I got to that $10 million, there, there also can be a, a situation where a mentor, if that mentor's goals aren't continuing to grow and increase, like you can almost cap yourself. Right. So I was, Tapping myself at that ten million dollar mark. So then I found another mentor that had sold his business. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on. Okay. So you're a young guy. Now this is this is important. You're a young guy. How long did it take you to figure out that? Hold on a second. This guy is a ten million dollar dude. I've made it now, and I want to get more than ten million. How long did it take you to figure out that this guy's not because he's a bad guy, but he's just capping me by his mindset? A long time. I mean, the I'm, the stuff that I'm giving right now, like this was like ten years of like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good though. It's because that's a key insight right there. Yeah. Painfulness. I mean, oh, so much pain there. Uh, yeah. Uh, ten, yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 years of acting, yeah, yeah. Uh, figuring that out. And then I found another mentor and, you know, this mentor had just sold his business for $151 million and was all, was talking about team and like personal and professional financial goals of your team members. And it was like to- totally foreign to me because like I told you, my, my, my previous mentor was always just ingrained in my head how much risk we were actually taking, how we didn't want everybody making decisions for the business because now all of a sudden we were going to be paying for that risk, you know, if that, and, but at the same time, that thought process was capping us where we're at. So this new mentor, um, you know, taught me about building teams and how you have to, you know, build teams with alignment. And that was the, that was the reason why my other mentor was nervous about, you know, the, you know, letting other team members make decisions because there was no alignment. So when you can create alignment in the decision making and understand that there's doers in the organization, then there's 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 thinking in the organization, then there's draining in the organization, and then there's watching in the organization. Well, the, the thing that you really want is you want doer thinkers, doer thinkers, people that are going to be doing off of good thinking. And when you find those, you double down with those people and you and you you give those people more opportunity in the business. That's excellent. So, um, how long your your initial partner that you that you uh, were JVing with, you had that handshake deal with? Um, how long did you work with him? So we we worked together from 2013 to like like literally like last year. But okay, so so you had quite a long relationship with him. Years, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, so you, you, you're growing the business. You started in 08. You're, you're, you're growing the business. You're getting to the point where you're hiring people. You've got those three pillars of, of cultural, operational, financial. Let me ask you this. You've mentioned here that, that you're, you're, you know, you're 
20 million last year. You're on the road to 40 million. I mean, that's a big jump, 20 to 40 million, and your goal is 100 million. How are you managing that growth in terms of being able to execute the projects profitably and not go totally insane at the same time? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And honestly, that was like one of the things that like held me back for so long is like I didn't understand the people game of this thing. I didn't understand the leadership game of this thing. I didn't understand how, like how to like all of that integrates with each other. And it, it had me on a roller coaster ride. Like one year we do 12 million. The next year we, we'd break down to eight. And then the next year we'd go to six. And then the next year we'd pop up to 10 again. Cause I got really excited and wanted to, you know, execute on stuff. It wasn't like, you know, this, we were starting off at like, you know, 16 and then we go to 20, then we go to 40. And, and the reason why we're going from, from th those jumps is because we have really good people around us and, and we're, we're leaning into those people and we're allowing those people to, to make decisions on, on our behalf after we've built out the framework for, for the decision making to be done in. And we're taking off, uh, you know, responsibility. So like before we used to have like project management operations was like, was intertwined, but like, what if you just totally separate the two? Now all of a sudden you have a person that's just totally focusing their eight hour day, 40 hours a week plus on estimating. And then you have the same thing happening for project management. Do you think you're going to get more done or less done? You're going to get way more done and it's going to be way cleaner because you don't have to turn on, put on your ass estimating hat and then take your estimating hat off and then put on your project management hat and then take your project management hat off and then put on your finance, financial hat. Like that's a nightmare. Now we have like all departments and leaders in those departments growing all of those departments. Excellent. So let's hold on. Let me let me ask you, um, you you because you referred to it a couple of times here. This framework for decision making. So it sounds like you're you're looking to empower your people, but at the same time you're you're giving them clear boundaries within which to make those um, empowered decisions. How did you develop that framework for decision making, and how would you describe it? I'm still like working on like an actual like actually how to like duplicate it. But the, the only way that I, I know how to do it is literally. I like to do daily meetings with the new team members as they come on, especially if they're a high level team member that's coming in. And like, well, the way I look at it is like, dude, that there, we just drafted our number one recruit. Like I'm not going to just let them come into the business and say, Hey, yeah, go, go, go execute on this. Like, no, I'm meeting with them on a day-to-day -day basis for the first two weeks. And then it's like, hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in that daily meeting, so you, I, I, I'm right. I'm right with you here. In that daily meeting, how is that structured? How long does it last? What are you talking about? It's it's a it's between thirty minutes and an hour. And the, and when I say thirty minutes an hour, like if we have a hundred projects to go over, it's probably close to an hour. When it, we got one or two projects to go over, it's it's closer to thirty minutes. We're walking through all of the day to day things that are coming up on that project and like how we need to respond to it. And then it's like now all of a sudden it gives this person this framework of like. How, how do we respond to it? And then now they're working on 10 different projects. So like this, this, the same problems come up, but they just come up in different areas. So it's like, now they're like, Oh, I answered that over here. And I'm going to take that from over here and then answer it on, on, on project 106. And I'm going to take that same answer from 106 and then answer it on 108. So then they, they get a, a way of like operating off of that understanding. So I'm basically downloading everything that I, 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 I have in my mind and my thought process to them. And that's in that daily meeting. And then we also have what I'll do is like if I'm doing like transactional things, like if it's like how to submit an invoice, how to put together a submittal, how to do like we will we'll just record ourselves. Like so similar like you're we're you're recording this, we'd record that, right? And then they would have literally a step-by-step -step instruction on how to do that. Cause not, now it's like even when we onboard new team members, it's like we'll literally say, Hey, go back and watch this video. And if you have any questions, reach out to me and then we can have a meeting off of it. That's brilliant. So tell us what what sort of software are you using to record that? How do you do that? Just so people know. I'll just use Mov Movavi Screen Recorder because it allows you to re record your screen. But there's all kinds of things you can do them on Zoom. You can do it like I think there's the program called Loom. Um, yeah, Loom. I it's use just, Loom. It's yeah. just taking the just getting ahead of the, the thought process and knowing like, hey, this is an asset. This is something that people are they're going to come behind me and execute on and having the mental awareness of that and then recording it. And then now all of a sudden having that asset. So the next person you bring on, you can just say, Hey, watch this video. And now all of a sudden you just bought back 30 minutes of your time. You didn't have to show that exact same process over and over again. 
Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I want to go back to this 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 two week framework, this time frame when you bring someone on board. Why is it two weeks? And then what are you? What is your meeting cadence like with a new hire, particularly you know a, a high profile hire in terms of after that first two weeks? Uh, so uh, the, I just set it up as two weeks. I mean, it could be four weeks. It, you know, I don't really have a, a, like a, like a, there's no definite cutoff. I mean, if the person is really important to the business and we really want them to be successful in the business, I'm willing to invest the time into it. And that's one of the, the, the leadership things that I learned. I just, the same way, you know, we'll buy a property and invest money into the property and invest time into the property, make it look beautiful. Well, you got to do the same thing with your people. If you want them to really be able to come into your business and operationally have an impact, you know, like I don't, I don't want people just coming into the business freestyling and doing things based off of what they think they should be done. Like, no, you got to train them. But the cool thing is, is once you train someone the right way, now all of a sudden when you bring in the next person, they can train them. That's excellent. Um, Okay, so you, you got that meeting framework, which I really like. You're not just hiring and then hoping and just letting people run with stuff. You're looking to download what you're thinking into their mind so that they understand what to do on various types of projects. You're growing to 40 million and you're wanting to get to 100 million. What's going to have to change in your business if you're going to get from 40 to 100? You know, we're doing projects that are, you know, four or five million dollars, but we also have a job that's like 30 grand. And the reason why we have a job that's 30 grand is because we, we signed up for a, like a, like this job order con construction contract, which is a million dollar contract, but it's, it's done in little task orders. What we're doing and what our, like after having meetings with the team is like, we're going to basically start killing off these smaller contracts because they're, you know, we're, 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 we're putting the A team on a $35,000 job, but we need to, you know, put, continue, continue to keep the A team on million dollar jobs, $3 million jobs, $5 million jobs, or $10 million jobs. Cause that's where, you know, you, you complete a $35,000 job at the end of the job. Like, even if you made all 35,000 in profit, it's still 35 grand. But like, if you complete a $10 million job and you execute properly on that job, you could, you could make some really good money, you know, and that, that, that's the money and the resource that's needed to continue to develop the team and add to the team and build the team. So that's that's a question that I'd, I'd like to ask you about then, because we all know in construction, top line's one thing, but there's a there's often a large gap between the top line revenue number and the profit at the bottom, right? As you're growing to a hundred million, what are your what what strategies do you have in place, and what's your mindset around maintaining acceptable profit levels as the business continues to grow? No, that's a really good point, and that's another thing that I learned from my mentors is like. You know, he, he always says, like, if you have a business that has revenue per head of like $100,000, you're, you're like, you're, you're, you're struggling to survive. But if you have a business that is, is making $250,000 of revenue per head, then you're actually a profitable business, right? And then if you're $500,000, you're even more profitable. If you're a million dollars per head, then you're, you're even more profitable, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, we're, I'm always looking at that, that revenue per head. We may have a need to hire more people, but we're not hiring people just to hire people. We're staying in alignment with that revenue per head. So we don't hire over hire people, you know, and over hire. Like we, we, we might need some team members to push a little harder and become more efficient. But it, like we have that, that strict parameter in there so that we don't get out of alignment with like the growth. Yep. Okay. So, um, let me just circle back then. Um, it sounds like you, you, you obviously you're, you're, you're building this business. You have a, a motivating factor of, of taking care of your mom and your sisters, um, that family based thing. What is your relationship with your dad like now? It was horrible for a while, you know, like, so I, I only told you like the beginning half of the story, the 30 grand, but yeah, right. <laughs> you know, like, you know, once it was all said and done those first five years, I, ended, we, we, you know, the reason why we separated is because we were like a half million dollars in the hole. I was tired of like not living and dying by my decisions. I was tired of like someone else's decisions, like, you know, getting muddy in the waters or maybe wasn't as profitable as I would have wanted it to be or whatever. So we, we made that, that split. Um, and the split I, with who? My dad, and like he, you know, he continued to do his subcontract stuff, and then I continued to do the. Oh, so you were when you first started your business, you were working with your dad? 
Yeah, yeah. So we we started it together because he he had you know obviously horrible credit. We had a similar name, and you know I thought it would be a good idea to uh, partner with him. Um, and honestly, like you kind of work with the you know the opportunities that are in front of me. Like like I worked a job, and like I I didn't make enough in that job to provide for myself, pay back my student loans, and take care of my mom and three sisters. So I, I always knew I wanted to be in entrepreneurship. I knew my dad knew something about this thing. I knew that it, he was a dangerous person be, because he had been successful, but he also lost money. But I thought like I would be able to like control that 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 relationship and not not get into a bad spot. And uh, yeah, we we ended up getting into a bad spot. So hold on, let me just I just want to be clear here, Oliver. So that, so you partnered with your dad in addition to the other guy that you that you had a partnership with. I partnered with my dad. Oh, 2008, we started the business. Partnered with my dad. 2013. I separated from the partnership with my dad. He went on to continue to be a, a subcontractor. I I wanted to only work as the GC because I was tired of getting beat up as the subcontractor. We were doing great work, but it just was it was really difficult for us to be uh, you know get paid on time and all of those things. And we we started to figure it out at the end, but like and when I say figure it out at the end is like I. I I was so tired of getting beat up that like we we had Skanska come to us and they wanted us to install 84 inch pipe under I-275 in, in, in Tampa, uh, Florida. And I told them that like we would do the job for 500 grand and they were like, oh no, like uh, you guys got to do it for like 300 grand. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do the job. And then I didn't answer their phone calls or anything. And they ca- called me back, kept calling me back. I was like, dude, if you want us to do the job, we'll do it for 500 grand. I want to get paid in 14 days and that's it. If you don't want to do that, then don't call me. Just leave me alone. And they, they agreed to the deal. Uh, so we were just starting to like, you know, get some momentum and we made really good money on that job. Um, and we've got paid I just want to say this. Days. Can I, let me just make a point here. Let me make a point. When the skanks, Skanskas of the world call you and they want you to work cheap, you don't have to do it. Oliver here is an example of that. You don't have to do it. If people aren't willing to pay you what you're worth, get your butt out there and do some business development and find the people who will. Sorry, little side rant. Go ahead. No, that is, that's really important though. You know, um, so, so we were starting to build like momentum, but there was just so much baggage that was with my dad that I was like, I just got to focus a hundred percent of my attention on doing work directly for the owner um, and, 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 and executing uh, as the prime contractor instead of the subcontractor. Because at the end of the day, like it's, it's hard to be in charge of your own destiny when you're constantly relying on another sub, like contractor to give you projects, you know? Um, and like, I wanted to be able to make the relationships in, with the owners because, and especially owners that had the money and the government had the money. Um, so we, I focused all my attention on that. And then the next 10 years, I, I, I partnered with my partner um, and, and we, we built that. Okay. So, yeah, so that clarifying question. Yeah, no, no, no. It's good because I think this is interesting because many people struggle obviously in their dynamic with, with, with their parents personally, but then you've got the business dynamic going on as well. 2013, you, you separate from your, from your dad business wise and we're in 23 now. So that's 10 years later. Do you, do you still have a relationship with him? Yeah, we, we do have a relationship now. Like he, he'll call me, you know what I mean? Like he'll, I'll call him occasionally. Uh, it's not the best relationship. Uh, you know, honestly, like I'm, I'm grown now, you know, like I got, yeah, I got my own, kids. I got a lot of stuff going on. So like, you know, you're a grown ass man, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. So like the opportunity <laughs> to go play catch is not like there anymore. You know, like sometimes I feel like that's what he wants to do. Like, Hey, let's go play catch time. It's like, dude, like I, I, I got so much stuff going on, you know, like I would have loved to play catch with you. Like, you know, when I was five years old or 10 years old, but like, yeah. It's okay. So, five, so I got it. I got it. So yeah. strong though. You know what I mean? Like that, that really, cause I was even thinking about it this morning. It's like, I didn't, I didn't have like someone to show me how to like shave, shave my face or like, you know, do the manly things. But at the same time, it was good because I became really observant and watched how other people were doing things. And then it, I could make a decision on what I wanted to do. And I didn't have someone constantly down my throat telling me what I needed to do. So like, okay. it's an interesting way to look at that. No, it is. It is. And, and it's interesting. So, so now let me ask you, do, do you, are you, do you have a family? Do you have kids? Do you I have two kids. I got a son and a daughter. My daughter's three. My son's one. Okay. So they're young. They're little guys. Okay, cool. Um, so, so then what are you doing Oliver to, 
to do? What are you doing differently with your kids that your mom and dad didn't do? How are you? Because this is really important, right? Because there's, you're under tremendous pressure running a construction business. It's it's difficult, you know, to balance all of the things that you need to balance. What are you doing differently in terms of being a, a father, being a husband that you're hoping will have a um, a different outcome in terms of, of your life? You know, I'm, I'm still knee deep in it, so I can only like really talk about. No, no, it's cool, dude. Bit. We're not going to hold anybody to it. You know what I'm saying? That. But um, no, yeah. believe me. Yeah. So like, it's, it's like, it's, I'm like, I was saying before, I'm like really observant. So like, I have a, I have a friend that had, you know, kids probably like 10, 10 years before I had kids. And I heard him one day, he was talking with his daughter and she did something that was like, she shouldn't have been doing. And he was like, Hey honey, you know, you don't want to do that. But like that word pattern of, Hey honey was been a, something I would have never said, but I was like, Hey, I really like that. And I was like, Hey, when I have a kid, I'm going to use, I'm going to say that same exact thing. So like now when I speak to my daughter, I'm always like, as mad as I'll be, I'll be like, hey, honey, you know, like we got to do it like this instead of like that. And it just softens the the Oliverness, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> Sometimes I can be like, ah, but it's like, hey, honey, like, you know, what are you doing? You know? Yeah, it's interesting. I, it's funny because I'm asking you about parenting and you got young kids and, you know, I got, you know, I got my oldest is 17 now, right? And so I'm always super hesitant to like give parenting advice. Um because I'm like, dude, I don't know if I'm qualified to give parent and advice. And I have five kids, you know what I mean? And and so it's like, you know, when I asked you that question, it's just interesting for us to think about what are the what are the what are the one or two things or the little things that we're doing differently that may have a massive impact on our kids? And we're not like claiming to be perfect parents or anything, but you know, we're always we're always looking to do something maybe a little bit different than our parents did. Maybe we're looking to do exactly what our parents did because they did a great job. But it's always interesting just to think through through those things. Yeah. Another interesting concept that I, I really am looking forward to, to working through with my kids as they get older is just the concept of like investing, right? As my kids get older, like even when I was a kid, I always wanted to have an allowance. I wanted to have money, but like, what did you do with your money? Like you just like either put it, you know, you know, spent it or you like would save it, you know? And it's like, but like, no, like what if, what if your parents taught you to invest it? And then the only money that you could spend was the return. On the investment. Ah, there you go. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, I'm thinking of like, you know, teach that concept to my kids, you know, so that they're, they have this investment mindset. Like I, I love, I invest in real estate. So like construction is the thing that generates me money, but I also do a lot of investing in, in real estate, you know, that, that real estate then generates, you know, income for me. And it's like, it's like this in income that comes in for me not having to go out there and push and shove. Like where's the construction, you know, you have to go out there and you have to push and you have to shove and you have to, you have to work for every dollar you get. Where's that real estate side and that investing side, it, it, it generates money without me having to show up, especially if it's if it's partnership pro properly. Right. And, and the, the deals that I invest in are hundred plus unit deals where I don't have to be on site. There's on site property management. There, there's partners that can handle, you know, a lot of the deal. And then I can focus on what I'm really good at. And that's like the construction on the deals. But once the construction is done, my partners are handling the other stuff. So it's like structure and their, their framework and their understanding of like how to invest. And then, and then when you do invest, live off the, the, the eggs and then keep your, keep your goose making you eggs, you know, type of thought process. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that's a, a tremendous thing for, for you to be communicating to your kids. That's awesome. So Oliver, just just tell us if people want to get in touch with you and and, and how, how they can do that and, and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, you can connect with me on uh, Instagram or Facebook at Oliver Fernandez underscore three. And then or you could also reach out to me at OliverFernandez.com. Excellent. We'll put the links in the show notes. And uh, Oliver, I really enjoyed having you on the show today. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on Construction Genius. Awesome. It was really a pleasure to be with you and work with you and just get a better understanding of the concepts that you're, you're talking about as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. That was an awesome conversation. Thank you for listening. It was a pleasure chatting with Oliver. And uh, feel free to go to the show notes. There's links in the show notes to how you can get in touch with him. And feel free to give the show a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. I appreciate you listening to Construction Genius today. And we'll catch you on the next episode.